I had a lot of fun making the four course date night meal earlier this year, and Jess and I had an even better time eating it. So thanks to today's sponsor, my friends at the Botanist Isla Dry Gin, we're gonna take another look at date night, this time with a New Year's Eve spin. We're celebrating with martinis before midnight, pairing the botanist with multiple dishes thanks to the gin's versatility and wide range of flavor profiles. Let's get down to basics. So just like the last date night episode, we're gonna make three different versions of a three course dinner. First up is three different flavor options for creme brulee, a great dessert to make ahead. For a standard issue vanilla bean creme brulee, I'm scraping one vanilla bean, measuring out 10 ounces of heavy cream and combining its guts and carcass with the cream in a small saucepan. We've also got two ounces of white sugar, about half of which we're gonna to add to our cream and vanilla mixture. The other half we're whisking together with three large egg yolks until homogenous in a large heat proof bowl. Make sure you don't let this mixture sit around for more than 15 minutes otherwise the eggs will start to clump. Over on the stovetop, we're bringing the heavy cream mixture to a simmer over medium heat, adding a little pinch of salt, and once brought to a simmer, killing the heat, letting it sit for about 30 seconds before carefully and gently tempering it into the egg mixture, that is slowly drizzling it in while whisking constantly, so as to not end up with sugary scrambled eggs. Once you get all the liquid and the vanilla pod added, and everybody's nice and homogenous, we're gonna strain this mixture into a spouted container. And that's really all there is to building a basic custard. A popular variation on flavor can be achieved by adding one and a half teaspoons of matcha powder to our half of the sugar that goes in the heavy cream. This is gonna help disperse the matcha powder and prevent it from clumping in the liquid. From there on out, it's the exact same procedure. Temper into the eggs, strain into a spouted container, and there you have it, a matcha flavored custard. Last up, we're gonna make a nice bright citrus custard, and this comes together a little differently. We're starting by zesting three oranges into our 10 ounces of heavy cream. Then we're covering this guy and letting him hang out at room temperature for two hours or in the fridge overnight. This is going to infuse the cream with all that lovely orange flavor. We're also gonna add one and a half tablespoons of freshly squeezed lemon juice to the egg and sugar mixture to bring a little acidity to our custard and tell our brains, hey, you're eating citrus right now. From there on out, you've got the same procedure as the other custards, albeit with even more reason to strain through a fine mesh sieve. And with that, we're ready to start filling our ramekins of choice, which are usually shallow and wide to maximize crunchy sugar surface area. We're also busting out the blowtorch a little earlier than you might think, because from a safe distance, it can get rid of any stubborn bubbles that haven't yet popped. Now, before these guys head into a 275 degree Fahrenheit oven, the casserole that contains them must be turned into a bon marie. So we're gonna pour in enough to come about two thirds of the way up the size the ramekins. Now, when you do this, you wanna line your casserole with a clean dish towel to prevent the ramekins from sliding around. You might notice that I'm not doing that, and there's a very good reason why I forgot, or rather I did it on purpose so that you learn from my mistakes. Either way, you're welcome. And this guy's headed into a 275 degree Fahrenheit oven for 20 to 25 minutes until the center of the custard is set, but still a little wobbly. Let them cool completely in the pan before wrapping and fridging for at least four hours, but up to three days. When it comes time to serve them, we're gonna need some super fine sugar. Not the easiest thing to find in the world, so if you need to make your own, simply blitz some white sugar in a food processor for about 30 seconds until it has a nice fine texture. Speaking of food processors, the next thing we're we're gonna prep for is our appetizer, a whipped ricotta, for which we're gonna combine eight ounces of high quality ricotta, the zest of one lemon, a generous splash of olive oil, and a little pinch of kosher salt in the bowl of our food processor. Blitzing for anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes, depending on what kind of texture and strength of will your ricotta has. Give it a taste for seasoning and consistency, cover and refrigerate until ready to serve. Now the variation for this ricotta is gonna come from its toppings. First up, what's become one of my favorite things to cook and serve this year, tomato confit. I got a half pound of multi color cherry tomatoes here reluctantly coming out of their package into a pie plate or shallow baking dish along with a handful of peppercorns, a few cloves of peeled garlic, a sprig or two of fresh thyme, a few leaves of fresh basil, a sprig of fresh rosemary, a pinch of kosher salt, a bay leaf, and optionally a couple dried chilies if you want a little heat. Then we're adding enough high quality mild olive oil to almost completely submerge the whole party. Then you can bake these covered or uncovered in a preheated 275 degree Fahrenheit oven for one and a half to two hours until the tomatoes have burst and your kitchen smells like just about the greatest thing in the world. This stuff is amazing and hang on to that oil. It's got a ton of flavor and you can use it in so many different recipes. Final pre-date night prep comes in the form of some adorable little Cornish game hens, which we're gonna cut in half by cutting straight down the center of the breasts and on the other side of the hen, removing the spine, which you can use to fortify your store-bought stock, so hang on to these. Now, so long as your date night only involves two people, you only need one hen. I've got two here for demonstration purposes. However you cook them, ideally the day before we wanna dry brine them, generously sprinkling them with salt and pepper that's been cut with about a 
teaspoon of baking powder. This lowers the temperature at which the Maillard reaction occurs and helps our birds become beautifully browned and burnished. So generously coat all sides, nooks, and crannies before stashing in the fridge uncovered overnight. The day of date night, and the first thing we want to do is make some baguette toasts for our whipped ricotta. Slice them up, brush them down with olive oil, sprinkle with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper, and bake at 400 for a couple minutes until lightly browned. You can do this up to four hours before showtime. Next up, we're going to plate our ricotta, spreading it out in a fancy dish bowl so there's lots of nooks and crannies. And then we've got three options for topping. First up, our tomato confit, making sure to drizzle with plenty of extra tomato oil. Garnish with some little basil leaves and make sure to hit it with freshly ground pepper and some big flaky crunchy finishing salt. And there you have it, one of my very favorite appetizers for virtually any occasion. But there are some variations we can do on this formula. For a deconstructed pesto, first we're going to mix a crushed clove of garlic into our whipped ricotta. Then I'm going to start by topping it with some toasted pine nuts, a drizzle of basil oil and or a sprinkling of actual basil both some little crunchy crystalline chunks of and freshly grated Grana Padano cheese, another little basil garnish, some freshly ground pepper, and flaky finishing salt. Super easy, super quick, super tasty. Plus you get to say that you made a deconstructed something, which is impressive to potential mates. Last but not least, I have some brown butter, which I fried some sage leaves in before taking it off the heat to cool. We're generously drizzling that all over the ricotta, arranging the fried sage leaves, hopefully in a better pattern than I did, sprinkling with some toasted and cooled pistachios, and drizzling with raw honey. And there you have it, a little sweet and savory something for your little sweet and savory something. You can plate and cover any of these guys up to two hours before serving. Just be careful of the brown butter because it'll solidify in the fridge. Next up, we're preparing a simple parsnip puree to serve with our hens. I got one big old parsnip here clocking in around a pound that I'm going to peel and cut into one inch pieces. Placing them in a large saucepan along with three quarters of a cup each milk and heavy cream, a sprig of fresh thyme, and a couple cloves of roasted garlic or some of that confit garlic if you got it kicking around. A couple pinches of kosher salt, cover it up, and bring it to a simmer over medium heat, lowering the heat once it starts a bubbling. Keep it covered and we're going to cook the parsnips for 12 to 15 minutes until they are completely tender. Then we're going to fish out our sprig of thyme, throw that away, and then using a slotted spoon or spider, we're loading the parsnips into a blender, along with about a cup of the cooking liquid to start and two tablespoons of butter. Blend on high speed until completely smooth, adding just enough cooking liquid so that the blender can do its job and blend. Once you have a delicious, earthy, rich, buttery smooth parsnip puree, give it a taste for seasoning, adding kosher salt and ground white pepper as necessary. Now there are two ways that I'm going to go over how to prepare your Cornish game hens. First up is good old fashioned oven roasting, which I'm going to do on a rack set in a rim baking sheet filled with mirepoix. This is going to catch any drippings from the birds as they cook and prevent it from burning. Then you're going to brush these guys down with the fat of your choice. You could use oil or clarified butter or animal fat. Then into a preheated 450 degree Fahrenheit oven they go for 15 minutes before reducing the temperature to 375 degrees Fahrenheit, continuing to roast until the thighs reach about 180, anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes. The other way to go is to pan roast. We're starting by placing the hen's skin side down in a heavy bottom, cold stainless steel skillet. As it heats up over medium high heat, the skin will at first totally glue itself to the bottom of the pan, but as it begins to brown, it will gently lift off, enabling you to give them a flip and placing your oven safe skillet into a 375 degree Fahrenheit oven. Once the hens are done and while they're resting for 10 minutes before serving, you're gonna have some nice fond in the bottom of that pan from which you can build a delicious pan sauce. We're starting by sauteing a small, finely minced shallot in the drippings over medium heat until soft and starting to brown. Then we're deglazing the pan with one cup of preferably homemade chicken stock, making sure to scrape up all that good stuff off the bottom of the pot, adding the juice of half a lemon, bringing to a simmer and letting reduce by about 75%, or until it's starting to thicken and take on the consistency of something like heavy cream. At this point, we're gonna kill the heat, add an optional teaspoon of Dijon mustard, and an entirely not optional three tablespoons of butter, whisking and keeping it moving to emulsify it into the sauce. Hit it with a tablespoon of freshly chopped parsley, some salt, pepper, if it's breaking or becoming greasy, add a little splash of water that'll help re-emulsify the sauce. And give it a taste. If it's too bitter or astringent, don't be afraid to add more butter. Maybe just add more butter anyway, who cares? In the end, you should have a thick, glossy, delicious pan sauce. Finally, to plate up, the dinner bowl is back. We're smearing some of the parsnip puree down the center of the plate, dropping our hen down in the center, saucing generously and garnishing with more fresh parsley. And there you have it. Easy, delicious, inexpensive, and there's something awfully romantic about a miniature chicken. Another topping possibility for the hen 
10 is a gremolata. We're starting by zesting one lemon into about a half a cup of packed fresh parsley, topping that with half a peeled and roughly chopped shallot, roughly chopped clove of garlic. And now you could spin this in a food processor and emulsify it with oil to make it more of a sauce, or you could just chop it up super fine, season it with kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper, and make it into more of a sprinkleable affair for your Cornish gay men. Just scatter it around the plate a bit, give it a drizzle of high quality extra virgin olive oil, and a sprinkle of flaky finishing salt. And there you have it, a more bracing and herbaceous take on the dish. But now it's time to go maximum thick and rich with a fig port wine reduction. We're starting by sauteing half a finely minced shallot in a tablespoon of vegetable oil in a large, wide saute pan for two to three minutes or until soft before deglazing with one cup of ruby port and one cup of preferably homemade chicken stock. Add half a dozen quartered fresh figs and bring the whole thing to an aggressive simmer with a sprig of fresh rosemary. Simmer until once again it's reduced by about 75% and has the consistency of cream. Then, same deal as the last pan sauce, we're mounting with butter. Lots of it. Until the more bitter aspects of the wine have mellowed out and you're left with a fruity, rich, savory sauce, which we're going to spoon over our Cornish game hen. And then for flavor, texture, and color contrast, I'm topping that up with some pea shoots or watercress lightly dressed in lemon and olive oil. Find the best angle and there you have it. Lastly, for our dessert, between 15 to 30 minutes before serving, we're grabbing our creme brulee out of the fridge and sprinkling it evenly with our super fine sugar. And then of course, the fun part, torching the damn thing. Gently and from a distance at first, but more aggressively once the sugar's melted, until you've got a bubbly brown caramelized crust, which will harden over the next 15-20 minutes. Optionally garnish with some mint leaves and a single raspberry. Don't pick it up with your hands at first because it's hot. Andy, what did I just say? Carefully set aside until ready to serve. And there you have it, folks, a mix and match romantic three-course meal. All it needs now is a great cocktail. Jess and I will be ringing in 2022 with the 22 Wild Isla Botanicals in the Botanist Isla Dry Gin, featured in this classic martini recipe. The range of different flavor profiles in the Botanist make it incredibly versatile in a number of different cocktails, but it's particularly nice in something simple like a martini, which really lets the gins shine. We're starting with two and a half ounces of the Botanist Isla Dry Gin, pouring it over ice in a mixing glass along with half an ounce of dry vermouth. Stir thoroughly until the outside of the glass is frosted. This both chills and dilutes the martini. Strain into a chilled glass and garnish with a lemon twist. And there you have it, a classic Botanist Martini. Perfect for date night and for toasting before midnight. Speaking of which, here comes my, um, wait, you're not, you're not Jess. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Thanks again to the botanist Isla Dry Gin for sponsoring this episode and for being such a great partner this year. From shrimp scampi to quiche to our rainy grilling live stream to my grilled summer feast and the classic smash burger, I've loved working with the botanist almost as much as I've loved drinking their gin. If you want to revisit the episodes featuring those dishes and their cocktail counterparts, I put them in a playlist here. Order a bottle of the botanist on Drizzly to get ready for the new year. The link is in the video description. And as always, please remember to enjoy the botanist responsibly. 